Fine. Good to have you all here. Well, this is an open discussion today, of course. I mean, maybe not the first, uh, the first part where I'm going to talk about scalps, which is um, a part of uh, day trading, as you probably know. More like a subdivision <laughs> of day trading. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then of course if you have any questions I will be very glad uh, to answer. Just um, to explain a little bit about uh, what scalps are all about. Just to explain what, uh, how maybe you can uh, handle scalps, how can you benefit from scalps or maybe beware of scalps because that's also a very important thing to know that scalps if you're not very experienced are considered to be very dangerous. So we're going to talk about uh, what is good about scalps and what is bad about scalps. Just uh, again just to uh, let you know and um, see if you if you all understand what is the basic uh, scalp then again it is kind of a subdivision of investing or let's say, let's say this way when we talk about uh, trading slash investing we in fact talk about time frames meaning if you invest in stocks you're here for the long run you're in because you want to take uh, the long longer time period it's usually considered in between weeks month and years and if you do that then your trading or in fact your investing should uh, support something that is a little bit different but you, you may still be used technical analysis but it's different than technical analysis I would say it should probably be more like 70% uh, fundamental 30% technical analysis the more the time frame shortens the more it becomes until the point where it becomes swing trading which is usually days and up to weeks up to a few weeks not two weeks a few weeks and then you come down to the shorter time frame which is day trading day trading of course is the day meaning most of my trades will be closed the same day sometimes I do take a swing from my day trading I do take a swing meaning I would continue with the trade for another few for a few more days uh, and that would become in fact a swing trade and that would happen with a very very small size of my of my quantity and sometimes within the day trade within the time frame of the day I would scalp I, I came to the conclusion I want to have this lesson today mainly because I had quite a few of scalps today which is quite rare I don't usually have them I want to discuss with you a little bit about um, the way that people do scalps how can you do scalp and you of course need to realize whether it's right for you or not and that is something that is very important for me to uh, to teach you today so firstly there are some people who are only doing scalps meaning that's their job it usually requires quite a substantial investment in time meaning these people do not come and trade for an hour like I do or much more than that like or a few hours they would usually that would be their job they would usually trade for six six and a half hours a day and that is what they will do it's a tough job and there are several ways within sc within scalping so in fact sc if scalping is a division there are several subdivision within scalping okay and I want to discuss with you uh, give you an example about what traders do as scalpers so let's take a look at a, sh at a stock that I traded today uh, in this case it's Mattel Mattel is down 7.4% and 
and it's not usually a company that comes down that much if you take a look at uh, the daily well it has its, its days of course recently more than um, than before uh, but usually as you can see the volume is much much slow smaller it would be something in the range of uh, in this case uh, what uh, 4 million shares but today as I mentioned as you can see here it has like 29 almost 29 million million shares now that would make it very I mean today it's very volatile not always very volatile but look at something very interesting during the first uh, few minutes actually and then this is I can't remember exactly where I took my scalp actually I do know that it was under 20 it was at 2051 so I guess it was was it here I can't remember it was a quick scalp and I think it was probably either here or there I think it was must be here um, but I'm I'm not sure hold on a second it's 12 no based on the time it was here okay so I had a short in Mattel it was a successful trade even though as you can see it didn't move much as you can see it moved down to 2038 yes that was the place I shorted it at 2051 and it came down to 2038 let me check it out just to make sure I'm not wrong actually I bought it at 2037 so how is that possible okay never mind so I shorted it that was a quick scalp I was in and out and that happened qu rather quickly but let me that would be another subdivision and I, I, I will talk to you about this a little bit uh, later I just want to explain to you what people do with scalp trading that makes it a little bit different for different people for example if you take a look at uh, Mattel right now look at the number of buyers and look at the number of sellers it has 29 million shares volume so if you take a look at the number of shares on the ask and the number of shares on the bid you can see that there's quite a large number of shares now if you see uh, for example uh, 12 here that will be 1200 or 37 or 6 at 637 that's uh, 3700 and, and 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 so on so we're talking about uh, um, large numbers now it's not very volatile as you can see here it's not very volatile so if you ask yourself what do really people do right now well they do some scalping right now right at this minute they do some scalping because there's no reason for it to be as you can see it's kind of locked here as you can see it's moving like one cent up two cents down two cents up something like that so you can see that there's a very small movement right now in Mattel that is due in fact to scalping that is due in fact to scalping now how much money can you make with a stock that is moving like uh, one cent or maybe two cents any idea I mean would you do something like that would you trade a stock to make a profit of one or maybe two cents interesting right would you <laughs> Well, Henry, I can teach you a way how you can do that, and you maybe—I mean, I don't—I'm I'm, not—I'm going to tell you something the way it 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 works in the market. But seriously, guys, that's not something I would expect you to do because it's something that, in my opinion, is very very dangerous. And well, some people are some people are good at that, but most people are—I mean, the vast majority of them are losing money, and it requires something that. Uh, I personally don't have so let me let me explain how it works yeah due to commission okay well due to commission it makes sense right because if I'm going to let's say buy 1,000 shares let's make it simple at uh, 2050 right now 2050 and let's say I could sell it at 2049 sorry by 2049 <laughs> sell it at 2051 I would make uh, $10 right 
with 1,000 shares. What would be my commission? In my case, I pay $5 per 1,000 shares. Therefore, I wouldn't make anything, right? Because I would buy 1,000 shares. I would pay $5. And then I would sell 1,000 shares. I would pay another $5. I would make a profit of one cent, which is $10. And then that means I'm not making any money. Yes, so if you pay $6, you'll be losing money, right? Because you will gain $10, but you will, in fact, pay 12. Okay, so how is it possible then to make money from scalping? It is possible to make money from scalping. First of all, you can't trade CFDs. I'm trading CFDs, as you know. There's huge advantages of trading CFDs my way, the way I trade because I need unlimited liquidity and because I want a quick in, quick out and because I don't want any slippage and with a stock with 29 million shares a day then yes, you can get that but most of my trades today were not with a stock that has 29 million shares therefore for me trading CFDs based on my system it's very very important but I cannot do what people who trade regular stocks do in the case of today, in the case of Mattel. So what do they do? They would do something like that. They would in fact be able to post their trades here. For example, let's say it's trading right now, disregard this, um, what you're seeing here, because it's what we call bad print. So it's not really bad prints. It, it has something to do with, with, uh, with routing, some, some orders are routing to different locations, but really disregard it. It's in between 2050 and 2051 right now. So there will be some traders who post their trades at 2050. So they will post, let's say, 100 shares at 2050, and they will have an order to buy. Now, did they get filled right now? Yes, they did. So right now they got filled. At 2050. They posted their trade at 2050 and for a second there you could see that the buy, that the sellers moved down to 2050. So it moved one cent down and then came back immediately back to 2051. So at the point that it was 2050, let's assume I had 1000 shares at the bid over here and somebody actually got them. Now when I'm trading, when I'm trading stocks and with a special account, not every account can do that, I can do what is called in the industry add liquidity. I could sit, the, sit here at the bid, which is theoretically what I did now, buy 1000 shares at the bid, wait for the sellers to come down, meaning I did not take out liquidity. Hitting the servers at 2051 and buying 1000 shares at the click of a button, that means I'm taking liquidity from the market. Taking liquidity from the market, okay? If I'm adding liquidity for the market, like sitting here right now at 2050, I will not get filled until they ask go down to 2050 like now for example that when I get hit meaning my quantity was filled at 2050 now I have a 2050 trade and I will be trying to sell it at 2050 now one so what I'm going to do now after I bought the 1000 shares I would post a sell an order to sell limit order to sell at 2051 1000 shares and now what will happen I will also add liquidity because I'm add, adding liquidity right now to the ask I'm adding liquidity here I'm not selling at the price of the buyers meaning removing liquidity from the buyer side I'm posting my trade right here on this side now what happens is that ECNs like for example ARCA, other ECNs, are paying traders to add liquidity. So you can get usually up to $2 per 1,000, even $3 sometimes, per 1,000 shares if you add liquidity. If you add liquidity. Again, if I post my trades here, I'm adding liquidity. I'm not hitting that number. So when the price comes down, the added liquidity means I won $3 per 1,000 shares. 
Now I'm posting my trades over here and I'm adding liquidity to the sell side. If I'm adding liquidity to the sell side and the price from here goes up to 51 for example, then they took me over once I was adding liquidity here, then I won another $3. So now let's assume that. Let's assume I still pay the same commissions, which is $5 in and $5 out, and of course I want to pay much less than that, and it is possible. Then I would add liquidity here, pay $5 for 1,000 shares at my price right now. I would still have $3 for adding liquidity, then I would move here, I would add liquidity here, I would pay $5 for the, for the 1,000 shares, but I would gain another $3 for adding liquidity, meaning add results, I would pay $10 for in and out 1,000 shares, $5 in, $5 out, but I would gain another $6 for adding liquidity on both sides. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand what I just mentioned? Is that clear? Or if you have any questions regarding that? I made it really slow. I repeated myself like five times. I hope it is. If it's not, let me know. Okay. If you have any question, write it down. So that's, a pos that's one thing that you can do. Buying at the bid does not add, does not add liquidity. It does add liquidity. If I'm going to post my trade right now at the bid, which is here, for example, I'm going to post a 1,000 share, okay, let's say 2,000 or it's a 1,000 share, I'm going to click the button right now, it's at the bid, it's going to sit here. It's going to sit here. It's not going to hit. I'm not going to have the order filled. The order is not going to be filled. It is not going to be filled. I'm going to sit at the bid. I'm going to add liquidity here, okay? So if I add liquidity here, that earns me, and of course the price comes down, that would earn me $3. Okay, so now let's assume the only thing I do, now take a look at bid, like take a look at, Ma at Mattel. It's not moving, it, it's moving by the sense. The thing that we've done, that we've seen here, the 2050 and the 2051, all of this, all of these people who are doing what I just described, they are all over this stock right now. The guys who are trading this stock, if you wondered who's the ones who are trading it right now, the guys who are trading this stock right now, traders, are the ones that I just explained that. There's nobody else there. Like who in his right mind would do something like buy or sell Mattel right now? So the whole volume that you're seeing here for every one minute of, for every, sorry, five minute of trade, you are seeing here a number of share which is like, uh, what? Uh, 400,000, 400,000 guys, that's 400,000 shares for every, excuse me, for every five minutes, every 400,000 shares of this is adding and taking out liquidity. Just imagine how much money is involved here. Are you getting my, are you getting the drift? Just double 400,000 shares every five minutes, every five minutes by $3. That's the number. Okay, if you didn't understand what I'm saying. And since there's a lot of people who are at the bid and at the ask at the same time, the result, they're locking the price. You see, that's what it's called in, the, in, in, in professional language, locking the price. Now, does the company like it? No, they hate it. Does the regular like it? No, they hate it. Who likes it? The people who are trading it. As long as they can, of course, be successful. Now, imagine this. How do you actually do that? You don't do it with 1,000 shares. You would probably do it with 10,000 shares, 20,000 shares, big numbers. Once, and you always sit on both sides. You sit on 2050 with 10,000 shares, and at the same time, you sit at 2051 with 10,000 shares. At the same time, it's the same time. You do the same thing all the time. You short it at 2051, you go long at 2050, and you just wait all the time for the price to bounce in between this and that. And if you go down from 10,000 to 5,000, you start adding, 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 and all the time you're like watching this. You don't watch the chart at all, you only watch this, okay? And it's not as simple as I just described. There are several rules on how to do that. And 
that's the way it's being done. But seriously, that is, I mean, if I close down the air condition, that's a sweat job. Sweatshop, sorry. Seriously, it's a sweatshop. It's not trading. It has nothing to do with trading. So yes, they call it scalping, but it has nothing to do with trading. It is a sweatshop. So people do that and they like sit and watch the bid and the ask. And you know, by the way, where they do that? There's like thousands of Chinese people right now doing that. Um, all supported and and uh, managed by some US persons whom some of them I know. And these guys are like, if you give them $500 a month, they would be very, very happy. And yes, they can make a little bit more than that every month. That's what they do. That's what they do. Uh, Tyler, and we're not talking about regular trading platforms like my platform, CFD platform, stuff like that. We're talking about special made platforms for taking liquidity, adding liquidity, and so on. Okay, we're talking about somebody's job. Now, that's one division of, that's one division of uh, scalping. By the way, the biggest division of scalping. There's another division of scalping, which is what I did today. So I saw a chance to go short. Let's assume it was here. I'm not totally sure about that. Let's assume it was here. I'm, I'm, I'm shorting a stock sometime during the day and I'm scalping it. Scalping it, again, that's a subdivision of day trading. And I had three scalps today. I had one in uh, Mattel, this one. I had another one in Kruger, KR. That was a 2597. Where was that? Right over here. Yeah. Oh my God, it continues like unbelievable. I think it was here. Yeah, it was here. First trade was here. First trade was here, which was an amazing trade. My, my best winner today is Kruger. And then the second one was right over here. Well, I didn't really think it's going to go that much, but uh, it did work out great. So that was another scalp. And I had another scalp with WFM at 33.99, right over here, which also worked out great. Okay. Now, I was helped today by the market. I did not expect such a big move, for example, not in WFM, certainly not in uh, Kruger after this uh, scalp, but it was not my regular trade. My regular trade would be like Kruger, for example. I go back to Kruger. My regular trade, and let's move to one minute candle because it's going to be a little bit more clear because you all know the way I trade. I mean, most of you anyway. So my regular trade in Kruger was right over here. You know what? Let me just check out the numbers where it was. Twenty-five ninety-seven was the first one. Twenty-six sixty-one. Twenty-six sixty-one. That was here. Okay. Now I think I posted it under twenty-six seventy. I'm not sure. I got it twenty-six sixty-one. That which which was here. So my regular trade would be, as I several said several times said here in the room, a reversal with a stock that is coming down. Right now it's nineteen percent. It was ten percent at that point. I would have my stop somewhere over here. I would have my target somewhere over there. That would be like my bread and butter. Uh, day trade. That would be like my bread and butter day trade. Then I made another trade right over here. That was again 25.97. Yeah, just below 26. That was a whole number. So I want to take it just below 26. We can take a look at it right now at um, five minute candles. That happened just here. So that was the second trade. And this one I regarded as, as a scalp. That was not 
my main strategy. I didn't really trust it to continue much. I didn't know what the market's going to do. So for me, it was a quick in, a quick out. I actually left another 100 shares where I moved. I think it was here. But I was in a, in, in a scalp mode, which means the following. And that's what the important part about uh, this lesson, maybe, is to explain to you what my scalp mode is and how how do I treat my scalps. So when I'm moving into a scalp, the regular risk reward ratio does not apply. I would have a theoretical stop loss and I would have a theoretical target. But when I move into a scalp, I would usually either move in and out with the, my, with the whole quantity that I had, or I would move in and out with most of my quantity. So if I would have probably 1,000 shares, I had less in this case. If I would have 1,000 shares and I would move short 1,000 shares Kruger, for example, in that case, I, at some point I would move out at least 900, if not the whole 1,000. And if it goes against me, I would be very, very quick to move out. So really, a regular, regular risk-reward ratio does not work in that case because usually scalps come at a point where you would have either a breakdown, not a reversal, a breakdown or a breakout. So if you go long at the breakout or you go down at the breakdown, that would usually be a scalp. And for me, it was a scalp because it was a little bit later that day. I didn't trust the market. I didn't trust the volume. I was expecting a quick in, a quick out. Actually got a little bit more than that. Could have got, could have had a little bit more than that. I didn't, but it did work out a little bit more than I expected. But that was planned to be a quick in and a quick out. And again, that the regular risk reward ratio does not apply. And that means I'll go short. I'll wait for it to come down. The first sign of weakness, like in my case, it was here. I would move out of everything. Before that, if I see any weakness and I can't remember what I saw, when I saw, I would move out with most of my quantity or all of my quantity. If it goes against me, I wouldn't let it as I would usually do. I would usually take a very small, relatively small stop loss. Generally, I would say it would be something like 50% of my regular stop loss. But my target has to do more with what the market is doing, what stock is doing. And I'll be much more sensitive to the level two. And I will not be very, very hard with my first target. Meaning, usually when I take a regular day trade and I have a 50 cent, let's say, target, I would definitely wait until I get my 50 cents and really, really, really hope it's, I'm, I'm going to get there and try to make the best of it all the way down to my planned and exit. In a scalp, I will be much more sensitive to the way that the stock is moving because I do not expect much. It could be because of the volume, it could be because of market behavior, it could be because of many other things. But anyway, it's a quick in, it's a quick out trade. It should usually work out faster. Now I have a question. Do you kind of hear about uh, what is the percentage of successful breakouts or breakdowns? What is, I mean, people talk about numbers sometimes. Did you did you kind of hear about it? What would you say in your in your opinion would be a success rate of a breakdown in that case? I mean, this one worked out, right? But in general, successful of breakdown or successful of, of breakout. So you would say like 80% success, Ghostbuster? Moshe says like 50-50, Henry 70%. Okay, 3%, Justin, okay, Tamash says 60%, 20, Eugene says, 20%. Well, let me tell you something. Um, if you ask uh, traders, advanced, I mean, successful, let's say experienced traders, they would usually tell you something that sounds like this. They would say 80% of uh, breakouts, breakdowns fail. 
Now, then you have to, of course, um, understand what does it mean to fail. Okay, so how do you how do you count failure in that case? Now, definitely, I wouldn't count uh, Kruger today as a breakdown failure because it continued to move down and never went back up. You could, however, when you take a look at uh, Mattel, say that this breakdown, assuming that was the one I took, I'm not, I can't really remember, it wasn't actually a breakdown, but this trade, let's call it this way, this scalp, you could say this one failed because it moved up. So it moved down, but then it moved out. But that has to do with how you manage the trade. So assuming I would have a quick in and a quick out whenever I see the first chance of Mattel changing direction. And I guess if I would move to one minute candles, there's a better chance that I'm going to see exactly what happened there. Let me try and see that. Okay. I believe it was here. Yes. I'm pretty sure it was here. Right over here. So, look at the way it came down. You see this breakdown over here? I mean, in one minute candles, you can definitely see the breakdown formation. So, it broke down over here. Look at the volume. This is a very extended volume, right? Now, if you can take a look at that uh, volume, that 381,000 shares. So, that was a very, very extended volume. Actually, the highest, uh, <laughs> the highest uh, volume bar during, during today. That happened right over here. And that failed because it went back up. Now, does that mean I didn't make money on this trade? No, absolutely not true. I Surely, I made money. I shorted it here. And then I moved out of the trade, or most of it, most of my quantity over here. So Mattel was a profitable trade for me today. You all, was, you, you all were, or most of you were with me in today in the trading room, and Mattel was a profitable trade. And then it came down, but then it failed up, it failed again. So I can't remember where was my stop loss. I had a stop loss somewhere on my last quantity, and I was out. So my... Whatever I've ha I had left, I think it was just 100 shares moved out somewhere, I can't remember where. But anyway, the thing was, if you manage the trade correctly, it will work out. If you wait for too much, if you don't see a reversal and you move out, then you may have a losing trade. So scalps are more like in and out very quickly, usually on breakdowns and break and breakups where you would have a large volume on a breakdown or on a breakup. You would have a quick move. You do not know if it's going to continue or not. You hope it's going to continue, but you certainly don't know. And yes, most breakouts or breakdowns fail. If you take a look at Mattel, that would be usually the way they will behave, meaning breakdown, retest of the breakdown point, which what happened here, continuation, and maybe potentially a losing trade later. So the question is only how do you handle it? The way to handle a trade like that, again, is to have a very, very small stop loss. So if you expect a breakdown to be successful, you want to see high volume. High volume usually makes sure that you're going to really have the benefit of taking a good partial right here at the lows. So once it crashed down with high volume, it was, it as you can see, it moved down quite nicely. But then you need to spot this point where you need to take your partial or move out from all of your quantity and not let it go against you. So if you manage a scalp correctly, you can be a winner even though 80% of the scalps fail. 80% of the scalps fail, or actually not scalps, breakups, breakups and breakdowns. Any question that? Let me see. Now, taking the opposite side, if you have 20 to 80, is not the right thing to do. Because, again, if you do that, then you go against the trend. And you don't want to do that. Yeah. 
Well, big ask, uh, bullish, big uh, bid, bearish, that is uh, true, but not in the case, for example, today with Mattel, because you really can't tell. Again, take a look at that. By the way, when we were watching it earlier, it was at uh, the 2050s, now it's at the 2060s. So it did make some, it did make some move. Well, sorry, we have to see it here, right here. So as you can see, it did make a 10 cent move. By the way, at that time, once it broke out of this very, very narrow range, from this very, very narrow range, 50% of the people that were doing this scalping, this one cent scalping, lost a lot of money because some of them just didn't see the stock coming back to the price. They are still, they still, let's say, sold at 2051, probably shorted at 2051, but now the stock is like 10 cents higher. If it's 8 cents higher or 10 cents higher right now. If it's 10 cents higher right now and you shorted 10,000 shares or 5,000 shares, just imagine that's a lot of money. So they make money as long as the stock is long to within range. And take a look at that. The, you, there's no other way to explain what happened here other than the stock is being locked. The people who are at the bid and the ask are trying to make money from... Uh, from adding and taking liquidity and here it is once it moved up 50% of them lost very dearly how do you master not selling too soon uh, experience nothing else I can say about that uh, Justin just experience you just need to know when you watch the level two, when you watch the charts, when you watch the volume, when you watch the market, because that helps you too. You just need to know where is the right point to move in and to move out. I didn't say scalping was easy. If, by the way, if scalping was easy, I would probably do it more than day trading, right? So the regular division of day trading that I do, going long, going short, with the trend, with volume, and so on is something that I personally decided to master. Not because I couldn't do scalping. I could definitely do scalping. I even tried doing that quite a few times, years, many years ago, but I failed. And I failed exactly at uh, times like that. While you take a look at uh, Mattel here and it moves up like uh, 10 cents or 15 cents or something like that and that would uh, even if you made some money over here that would put you in many times in like 50 percent of the time that would put you under big time and then what do you expect these people who are, who are training it right now doing the one who shorted it in 51 they are actually averaging their positions right now so if they're averaging their positions right now and it doesn't come back that would probably be the end of their day or the month or their trading career. career. I'm, I'm telling you, I've been there, I've done that. And I wasn't successful. I am aware that some people are successful at doing so. But, that, but then again, if you turn out the air condition, it's a sweatshop. Do you want to do that? Hmm. Maybe. So basically the stock is moving sideways, the scalpers are making money. If the stock goes up or down, half of them, exactly, absolutely so, Kevin. They need to see the stock not moving. Right now it's disastrous what just happened right now. By the way, I don't know if you remember that time, the world time after 2008 where Citigroup crashed down to $3. And at the point, it was a long, long time at $50. And it had volumes of hundreds of millions of shares a day. And all of this volume came with the people who rode it at $3. It wasn't a $20 stock. Like this 20 cent move that we're seeing right now at Citigroup could have been like 2, 3 cents. Now, a stock that is at 2, 3, I'm sorry, at three dollars and moving up two three cents up and down that's like heaven for these guys right because all they have is Citigroup, one stock 
at three dollars, very cheap. Therefore, they can buy it at hundreds of thousands of shares at the bid and the ask. It moves up or down by two or three cents a day, and of course, it's their fault because they're locking the price. And if they're locking the price, and that's what the the, the stock, in fact, is uh, is is doing and they're locking it, then they have a better chance to make money. And that happened for years, until Citigroup decided that they had enough with these guys, and uh, did a reverse split, and moved the stock to $30. That is, uh, for every person who had 10 shares, he's got now one, sh one share only, and that, in fact, uh, move the stock price to $30 instead of $3 and then the game was over. So in one day all of these guys had to find a new job. Uh, sorry, Tradefix, for the audio. You know what? Let me shut down um, the video. I shut down the video, Tradefix. Let me know if, if that makes it better for you. Sometimes that helps. I don't know. I hope it does. Well, for most of you, but um, with, with some people who has some issues with the internet, I sometimes have myself issues with the internet. So with some people who have issues with the internet, then yeah, that, that makes my audio a little bit challenging. Do you lower your size if you trade stock down 5%, but it has been uptrending on the daily markets close by the way yeah I would Justin I mean if I have an issue uh, I mean when I trade a stock whatever it does today has to do also with the market uh, behavior with the trend and everything so there's several reasons why I would lower my size sometimes when I see let's say market direction on the right way when it's less than five let's say it's less than five percent I would probably be a little bit more careful with that. That could mean smaller size. So there's several other reasons why I would lower my size or raise my size if I really like it. Let's say it's like down 10% and markets my way and daily looks great, then maybe I would double my size. Any more questions, guys? Q's finished down today, 0 0.45. S&P marginally down, just 0 0.15. Still down, but no big deal, really. In fact, if you take a look at the market, we weren't too far from closing the gap at the S&P. If I take a look at the queues, we did move up, but we still finished down. Buyers are coming. Buyers are coming. When you first started tra trading, what was your starting capital and share size? Uh, Justin, I started with uh, $32,500 in my account, and that was due to the fact that I had an account with a U.S. broker, PDT rule, and all that stuff. I needed to have more than $25,000 when I started, so I started with $32,500. My first most stupid trade was 1,000 shares. Really, the first time I clicked anything, I did it with 1,000 shares. I still can't believe how stupid I was. But then, very, very quickly, I moved down to anywhere between 200 to 400.
any more question traders now the result of what I would expect to be the, res the result I would expect to be to from this lesson is that you can in fact consider scalping but you do not have to take it with the same rules as day trading I mean day trading the way I trade now you can develop and I always mention that you can develop your own style of trading and it's very very important to develop your own style of trading if you do trade somewhat like I do like day trade which sometimes lasts a few hours sometimes just a few minutes most of the times more than just a few minutes like maybe 20 minutes 30 minutes usually after a partial then that's not a division of scalping that is straightforward day trading but if you do scalping then I would expect you to start developing some very specific rules about scalping I mentioned scalping today because unlike regular days I had probably three or maybe more scalps today and that is quite rare usually I would have more scalps as the day goes by meaning if I would trade later which I don't usually do but if I would trade later and I did that many years ago then I would have more scalps than day trades because I would trust the market less I would trust the stock I'm trading less I would trust the lowered volume less I would move in and out faster I would try and make a hundred dollars there a hundred dollars here I wouldn't have a big winner or big loser as I do have at the beginning of my trading days I would just try to accumulate more money so scalping makes sense scalping the good thing to do as long as that's not your main business because scalping is a little bit harder you need to be more experienced you need to know exactly when to move in and when to move out you need to be very quick with the mouse or with you know orders even if you use um, if you do, even if you don't use uh, uh, the mouse um, you need to be very very quick very very experienced and yes this could be beneficial so no more questions I'm done for the day thank you very much for being here with me today that concludes our mentoring session for the day trading thank you traders for being here Traders, if you like to learn trading, trade live with me and get a funded account without risking your money, click in this corner in order to learn more about my funded accounts program. And if you're not subscribed to this channel, just go ahead and click subscribe. Over here, you can find some of my best live trading videos. And please, if you have any questions, let's have a discussion in the comments below.